consist your meeting following the service today. And looking ahead, we have our annual meeting on November 10th. So um, keep that in mind as that is an important date for um, all of the congregation. Yes, Jen. If you have any bills that have to be turned in, please try to do it as soon as possible so I can get the report ready. Perfect. Perfect. All right, and that is all I have for announcements. So if we could please rise, if we will, and join together in the call of worship. The invitation is given to every person by Jesus Christ. Come to me, follow me, be my disciples. We come, we come to this place, to this time, at the invitation of Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ, we accept the invitation of, to discipleship. In, In the name of Christ, as his disciples, we, we worship and praise God. In the midst of a world where cruelty abounds, we proclaim the God of compassion. In the, In the midst of despair that threatens to swallow up whole lives, whole peoples, we, we proclaim the God of hope. In the midst of indifference and apathy, we proclaim the God of love. Come, let us worship together and share our witness of God's living presence in the world. Let us join together in the opening prayer. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit, that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us join together and sing hymn number 322 when morning gilds the skies.
We worry about things we cannot change. We wonder if you are even there at all. For all the times we have doubted you, Lord, forgive us. For all the ways we have neglected your word and ignored your people, forgive us. Do not be far from us, Lord. There is no one else we can turn to for help. Renew our fickle hearts and help us put our trust in you. Amen. There is no wrong that God cannot make right. There's no chasm that can separate us from God's love. God will not forsake us. He's not going to leave us. The Lord is patient. He is kind. He is generous. And he is good. And by the power of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of our sins. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 90, verses 12 through 17. Teach us to live well. Teach us to live wisely and well. Come back, God. How long do we have to wait? And treat your servants with kindness for a change. Surprise us with love at daybreak. Then we'll skip and dance all the day long. Make up for the bad times with some good times. We've seen enough evil to last a lifetime. Let your servants see what you're best at, the ways you rule and bless your children, and let the loveliness of our Lord, our God, rest on us, confirming the work that we do, and yes, affirm the work that we do. Our epistle today is from the fourth chapter of Hebrews, verses 12 through 16. God means what he says, what he says goes. His powerful word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense. 
laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one can resist God's word. We can't get away from it no matter what. Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Have you ever watched the Mission Impossible movies? I think there was a TV series, maybe even um, like that as well. But I think there was like maybe eight movies on Mission Impossible. And I, I'm pretty sure I saw the first one, but that was some time ago. And to me, the Mission Impossible title just seems kind of weird because the mission really isn't impossible, right? It's always completed by the end of the hour and a half or two hour movie. The mission that was impossible is taken care of. And in our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus is speaking about a mission that really is impossible. He talks about a camel, which is the largest land animal that is native to Palestine. And he talks about that camel going through the eye of a needle, which, I mean, that opening is tiny, right? So that's impossible. It's impossible to put that camel through the needle. Let's see Tom Cruise get the camel through the needle, and his mission impossible, right? About the only way that any one of us, and even good old Tom, can get that camel through the needle is by some computer-generated CGI movie magic. It's the only way that's going to happen. But it's not impossible for Jesus. If he wanted to, he could perform a miracle, and he could take that camel, and it would just slip right through the eye of that needle, no problem. He takes every mission impossible, and he makes it possible. He accomplishes it. And we had better be thanking God daily that Jesus can do all these things. Because knowing that it is impossible for us to be perfect, for us to keep God's law, knowing that it is impossible for us to go to heaven no matter what we do, Jesus came to accomplish that mission for us. Because we can't do it. So, mission impossible? No. Jesus makes it possible. In fact, he makes it certain. So let's listen to our gospel lesson today. The whole gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. But I am going to read only part of it at this point, and then I'll finish it off a little bit later in the message. As he went out into the street... A man came up running, greeted him with great reverence, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, honor your father and your mother. And the man said, Teacher, I have. From my youth, I've kept them all. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. He said, there's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth, and then come follow me. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear, and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was very rich and holding on tight to a lot of things, and not about to let go. That man sounds like he had it all, right? Their other gospel account tells us that he was a synagogue ruler with great wealth. So he had wealth and power and honor and, and high morals, right? And respect and authority in the community. He had it all. Except for one thing. He didn't have the certainty that he was going to heaven. He was lacking that. He sensed that there was something still left for him to do. So he, and he didn't know what it was. So he went to Jesus. 
And so he ran up to Jesus, and, and in reverence, I'm sure he fell to his knees, and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's no indication in the Bible verses that this guy was anything but sincere, right? I think he really wanted to know. And Jesus, he got right to the heart of the matter because Jesus knew this guy's heart. And he knew that this guy thought really highly of himself. And Jesus basically reminded this guy that he really wasn't as good as he thought he himself was. And remember, the man called Jesus good teacher. But there is a world of difference in believing Jesus to be a great man or a good teacher and believing him to be the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. And so Jesus began to lead this guy to recognize who he really was. And he says, why do you call me good? Maybe the man meant good teacher as merely a compliment. It kind of seems like, like the man didn't really think he needed Jesus as a Savior. He wanted Jesus as a guide. He wanted to be told what he needed to do. And so Jesus brought up the law, right? He brought up the law, and he listed some of them off, and the man, who apparently was quite full of himself, he says, you know, yeah, I've done all that. I've done it all. Because he thought sin was only involved in, in the outward actions, not in the inward attitudes and thoughts. And so, because he had never murdered anyone, or cheated on his a neighbor with a wife, or stole his cattle, or, or anything like that, he thought he was a pretty good guy, right? Pretty good guy. He had no need for a savior. But Jesus loved that child of God, and he couldn't let him continue on in this destructive and deadly self-righteousness that he was, he was basically in the middle of. And Jesus says, Nah, you really haven't kept all the commandments. You can't get past the very first commandment because you love your wealth more than you love God. And so then Jesus unveiled that greed, right? He says, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. So what was it? that this guy truly lacked. Certainly, he didn't love God with his whole heart because basically, he was putting his wealth first and not God. He had his wealth up here on this high pedestal and God was somewhere below that high pedestal of wealth. So basically, what this guy really was lacking was perfection. That's 100% what it is because God demands no less than perfection. He doesn't demand that people try their hardest. Do as good as you can. He doesn't demand that they just refrain from outward sin, but it's okay to have inward sin run amok. That isn't what happens. God demands that people are perfect in every way, inside and out, in order to be part of his kingdom. Quite frankly, that is impossible. That is truly an impossible mission for any one of us to do, no matter how hard we try. It's just not possible, ever. What if Jesus said to us, go and sell everything you have, give it away, give away all your money, give away all your possessions, and come and follow me. What would we do? I'm not asking that because that's what Jesus is demanding of us. But so that we can examine our own hearts. It's a question that I think we should all ponder on for a little bit. I read a story once about how people used to catch monkeys. They put an aromatic nut of some sort in a jar and the jar was fixed in place somehow. But they would put this nut inside this jar. And the jar itself had a fairly narrow opening. And then it would open up into the cavity where this, the nuts were in, right? And so the monkey would come along and smell that nut, clearly want it. 
I don't blame the monkey, I love nuts, right? So he would see this lovely cashew maybe in there, macadamia nut, who knows? And the monkey would reach his hand into that narrow opening and grab that nut, hang on to it. And when he went to bring the, the fist back out, it was now too big to fit through that narrow opening. And so they couldn't pull the hand out. And they were unwilling to let go of that nut because they wanted that nut. And so they just kept hanging on to it and kept trying to get out, but you couldn't. Because they wouldn't let go of the nut. And so all too often, I think that the devil traps us on that very same monkey trap, right? We all cling to our own self-righteousness, our own good actions, instead of our Savior. And we are unwilling to let go of our trust in ourselves, our trust in our money, and we're unwilling to let go of our trust in our charitable acts, in our good deeds. And we fail to trust Jesus. We're trapped with our hands in this jar, and we're ensnared by the hunter because we are less than perfect. We don't meet God's standards. We fail the mission every single time. Basically, we're doomed, right? Because we cannot keep the law perfectly. But Jesus can, and he did. He completed the impossible mission. Now, as far as that young man goes that we've heard about today, we don't really know what happened to him. We don't know if he continued to just trust in himself and his wealth and just basically reject the need for a savior and then eventually, you know, perished eternally. We don't know if he reconsidered his position and claimed Jesus as his savior and was saved. We don't know. But as the man walked away from Jesus, he continued the lesson that he kind of started with this man. He continued that lesson with his disciples because he wanted to teach them that it was impossible for even the disciples by their own efforts to get to heaven. So let's hear the rest of our gospel lesson from Mark. Jesus watched him go, then turned around and said to his disciples, it's almost impossible for the rich to get into the kingdom of God. This amazed them, so Jesus said it again. Dear children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were incredulous. Then who in the world can be saved? if not a rich man, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently, and then he said, Without God, it is utterly impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Then Peter began to mention all that he and the other disciples had left behind. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. And Jesus replied, Let me assure you, that no one has ever given up anything, home, brother, sisters, mother, father, children, or property, for love of me, and to tell others the good news, who won't be given back a hundred times over, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land. All these will be his here on earth, and in the world to come he shall have eternal life. But many people who seem to be important now will be the least important then, and many who are considered least here shall be greatest there. I don't think that there's anything wrong with having wealth. I don't. But I think the issue is when we trust our money, when we trust our possessions and our prestige more than we trust Jesus. There's no way to fit an entire camel through the eye of a needle. It's impossible. And it's equally impossible for the rich and the poor and the middle class 
to get the, to the kingdom of God without Jesus. Because God demands perfection, and we can't measure up. The sins of pride and arrogance and self-righteousness, the sins of greed and love of money and all these other ones, they're all going to exclude us from the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples understood that, what Jesus was saying. And when we heard, they were amazed. They were incredulous. It was that hard for somebody to get to heaven, that impossible. Nobody could do it. Salvation is impossible for any of us on our own. But that doesn't mean impossible. The angel Gabriel told Mary, if you recall, and Mary wondered how she, a virgin, could possibly give birth to a son. And Gabriel said, nothing is impossible with God. And a virgin did conceive and did give birth to a son, and God became man. And that man did the impossible all the time. He did the impossible when he healed the sick and the demon-possessed. He did the impossible when he cured incurable diseases like leprosy and paralysis. He did the impossible when he controlled the weather at his command. He did the impossible when he raised the dead to life. He did the impossible when he fed more than 5,000 people with five loaves and just a couple small fish. He did the impossible when he walked across the surface of that lake. Jesus did the impossible so often that that's just what people came to expect from him. He just does the impossible. Honestly, the whole Christian faith is built upon impossible miracles. God came to earth to live as a man with human flesh so that that immortal God-man would die. And now all sin is paid for by the blood on that cross. What is by nature impossible, a person going to heaven by their own goodness, is made possible by Jesus, possible because he accomplished the impossible mission. It's true. That somebody can go to heaven without riches, without honor, without learning, without friends. But you cannot get to heaven without Jesus. That is impossible. But, dear friends, thank God that we do have Jesus. Because the impossible mission of entering heaven is made possible for every one of us. It's certain with Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join together in seeing him number 528, God of Grace and God of Glory. Mm -hmm.
God of infinite patience and wisdom. We come to you with so many things that claim our time, our energy, our resources, our very lives. We're easily drawn away from serving you by the enticements of the world for wealth, ease, and comfort. Just like the man in the scripture, we're owned by our possessions, held captive by our treasures. You continue to offer us healing and hope. You seek to transform our lives from captivity to freedom in witness and service. We look at the world in which there is so very much warfare and strife, anger and hatred, and we easily become overwhelmed by the needs and the stresses. Help us to place our lives and our trust in you, knowing that with your help, Many wonderful things can be accomplished, which will provide hope and peace for others and ourselves. Give us courage and strength to truly be your disciples. Holy God, we pray for an end to the waste and desecration of your creation. We pray that the fruits of creation are able to be shared equally among all people, so that all communities and nations may find sustenance in the fruits of the earth, in the water that you have given us. Almighty God, you created the world and gave it into our care so that in obedience to you we might serve all people, inspire us to use the riches of creation with wisdom, and to ensure that its blessings can be shared by everyone. Lord, we ask you for your care and healing touch for those who are sick or injured. We ask for your compassion on those who are suffering, for your comfort, for all that are grieving. We ask for your direction to those that have lost their way, and we ask that you help those that are looking through the lenses of scarcity to throw them away so they can get a new outlook on life by turning their eyes towards Jesus. We pray for all people that live in places of war and violence. We pray for all those dealing with the devastation from Hurricanes Helene and Milton. And we pray for the people dealing with the wildfires to our west. We pray for the countless people living with addiction and homelessness, depression and hunger. We pray for Don, Christine, Bonnie, Eileen, Gladys, Lorene, Graham and his parents, and all those that we name in our hearts. You know exactly what each one needs, and we thank you for your daily tender mercies. We thank you for your daily love and your grace. We call upon you, Lord, to empower us as we declare who you are to a world who desperately needs you. And we call upon you, Lord, to inspire us as a congregation and us as individuals as we seek to inspire others. We pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we join with people all around the world to pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Thank you. 
attention on you. As we practice these spiritual disciplines, we hope to draw even closer to you. We pray in the name of the Jesus Christ, who offers salvation to all throughout our world. Amen. Let us join together in singing hymn number 520, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Go in peace.